Good evening. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call this meeting to order. This is a regular meeting of the City Council of Satellite Beach. Time is approximately 17, 7 p.m. and Mayor Catino is out of town for tonight, so I'll be filling in. Uh, if we could all please rise for a moment of silence and the Pledge of Allegiance. Have a moment of silence. Okay, please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, let's move on to agenda item number three, which is citizens' comments. We will take uh, residents first. You have five minutes, and this has to be on non-agenda items. If it's an agenda item, don't come up and speak on it. Non-agenda items. Introduce yourself and where, you're, where you are from. My name is Dan Willman, and I'm from Carriage Park. Last week, uh, well, last, uh, last council meeting two weeks ago, I was here, and the uh, city manager basically stopped short of calling me and my friends fake news. I'd like to clear the air a little bit on that. So I brought up the soil arsenic report that, by the way, is buried on the website. You can't find it unless you know the title of the document and search for it in the search box. The Tetra Tech report that should be on the website, easily accessible by everybody, shows, let's see, 3.6, 3.8, 4.4, .4, and 4.9 milligrams per kilogram of arsenic in the soil that was put down on our beach. The Florida Department of Environmental Protection, yes, I, I recognize that Florida's soils have a naturally higher level of arsenic than everywhere else in the country. The Florida Department of Environmental Protection set in the 90s a soil cleanup target level for, of uh, 3.7 milligrams per kilogram, which was later updated to 2.1 milligrams per kilogram. It went down. That soil cleanup target level is half that of what the soil put down on our beach contains. I have a chart here that shows over the overwhelming majority of Florida's soils are below the 3.7 milligrams per kilogram cleanup target level. This is what I've been spreading. It's not fake news. It's not misinformation. And if the city manager continues to say that we are yeah, putting out yeah, base information. Just speak your comments. Don't direct them at anybody. If the city manager action. continues to, to uh, suggest that this is, fake in, this is false information, this is fake news, maybe it's time for a new city manager. This is not fake news. These are reports that were at one point put out on your website and then pulled and hidden. I think this should be accessible to all of the public and that's what I'm doing. I'm making it accessible. I'm pointing out that the target level is half that of what was put down on their beach and the majority of the soils in Florida are below the 1990s cleanup target level. That's a problem. My second topic I wanted to address while I'm here, uh, there was recently a post, the city manager in the police department's Facebook pages about skimmers on the pumps. I think we need to talk about making a resolution to require that all gas pumps in the city have tamper evidence seals put on them. As I understand it now, it's, um, it's up to the station owner whether or not they, they include a tamper evidence seal over the locking mechanism on the pumps. I think that needs to be mandatory citywide. This has gone on too long. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Any additional residents with comments? Mm -hmm. Diane Douglas, Holly Drive. Um, Thank you. Thank you for sharing the number information because twice as high is pretty, pretty bad. Um, let's see. So what I want to talk about or ask questions about is um, I was appointed to the beautification board, and I just don't, I'm, I'm not sure what the 
purpose so that I can have a bigger picture of what to do while I'm there. Um, is this the appropriate time to ask? Because we have to present everything to you for approval. So I thought, it just make sure that, is it for tourists or visitors, or do we want to get the community involved? Do we want to focus it to the future and climate change? Just um, so I have an idea of, you know. Um, Diane, have you been to the meeting yet? I yeah, mean, I was there. Uh, yeah. Did, did they give you a manual that outlines what the responsibilities and that sort of thing? No, I have not gotten a manual. So it's all in there? It should be in there. Uh, there was a manual that updated all of that and gave you all the directions of what the focus I is. I have gotten anything. Okay, well, Grace, Grace will be. Okay, well, that would be why I'm questioning. No, I okay. think I'd probably answer all of those questions. Yeah, all right. Well, good, 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 good. Okay, thank you, yes, because I was confused. We're well, not really confused. I was curious as to where, what I could do and where that direction would go. And, and just so you know, every board that the city has, there's information on all the boards in that document, so you'll get to see what all of them do. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I was looking for more specific as to just the overview. Yours will be in there. Yeah. Okay. Right. There's a lot of work that went into making that book, so it's real clear. So once you get that, I think they'll answer. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just thought it would be here already. Had I gotten that, I wouldn't be asking this question. I wouldn't be standing here, except for yes. And then, yes, quality of water. And if you notice that the um, water this year, the sand fleas were dead floating in the water while I was out there. I've never seen dead sand fleas before just floating in the water. Um, the other thing with quality of water, the water is a beautiful, lovely color. It reminds me of the color that's down south that they do for um, draining out the, I don't know if it's the lime mines, the down south, you know that color when you drive down the, Mm -hmm. I-95 and the, the, that pretty pond you see there and that lovely green, we have color that remnants or, you know, resembles that color. So the ocean's not of a color that I've seen before. So there's stuff going on. So yes, yes. So um, I'm piggybacking on to what he says. But I do monitor the, the water all the time, not with numbers, but just by eyeballs and 30 years of walking by it. Okay, thanks. Yes, Additional citizen comments? Okay. Okay, hearing none. Uh, non residents, are there, and you have five minutes. Good evening, Sam Sullivan, South Patrick Shores. I'm here for a couple reasons. Um, I've been noticing a degradation in the traffic. Um, of course, we're one large community, uh, whether we're in South, in South Patrick Shores or Satellite Beach. I made a request for the Department of Transportation to do a corridor study. Um, I looked on their website. I do not see any studies um, for uh, the A1A between Pineda and O'Galley. Um, so I've reached out to them. I've written them. I cannot get any data on that. We had a zoning change up in South Patrick Shores. I requested from the county the paperwork, and I was very surprised to see Look, to see that the level of service, the LOS, between uh, Ocean Boulevard and Berkeley is a D. And then when I looked up other reports um, south, um, you had level of service ranging from C to E. So in the broad spectrum of planning, we all have to work as different communities and have a broader picture of the beach side along that line. Second issue is I know um, you guys are aware of the public's concerns about drinking water. Uh, this summer we had the algae issues. Um, people felt that the saxitoxin was in our water as indicated by the earthy musty smell caused by the geosmin. Um, a lot of people were sick. So we've been keeping the a closer eye on the water, and we found, um, we got some reports back because we've been testing a lot of coliform positive water, um, and the, you're aware that the county did testing after the town hall, 130 tests, and a number of those came back with coliform bacteria. Um, not E. coli, but we don't know what kind, and as you, I don't know if you're aware with Flint and other areas around the country, the issue wasn't actually so much lead as it was people dying of legionnaires. So the having coliform bacteria is a very serious issue. I want to bring your attention to it. 
The third thing is, of course, you've heard from the advocacy that we have the funds eligibility now after 30 years. Uh, that's a very big deal. The meeting will be held here in Satellite Beach at Pelican next week. Um, I also want to bring to your attention regarding that, that it's not just the disposal site on South Patrick Shores, but there's also a drainage channel that came down from a chemical disposal area to the area above Pania and then on down, and that comes down to roughly Satellite High School. And so there's a question mark, does this relate to the cancers at the high school? The second aspect is there's another drainage channel that comes down off of the what we call Scorpion Dump, and that goes all the way down to Indian Harbor Beach. It's on the EPA Epic Study, which is online on my group on, on uh, it's now Waves, uh, is our new name, so Waves Beachside. Um, so you can find that Epic Study there. This is a page of it, and it denotes the drainage channel. And then lastly, um, I made a request uh, to the EPA to come in and investigate that because that drainage channel it is, does not come under the FUDS. So I want to be very clear about that. The drainage channel does not come under the FUDS because the FUDS is for the disposal site and the, the otherwise possessed area um, by the Banana River Naval Air Station and Patrick Air Force Base. What that channel is, that's contaminants coming off of the military base, so that would come under RAB. So um, I just want to make you aware because I understand you guys have a, a lobbyist that, um, that you pay to help with issues. So that might be a good task for them to advocate to get some testing and have Patrick come in and evaluate because the county found TCE in that trench area, which up in our area in South Patrick Shores is delineated between uh, Pelican and, and Seagull. And so between those two houses, that's where the trench ran. And they did a shallow well in there and found tri uh, triethylene, trichlorinated ethylene, TCE. Basically what it is, it's the solvents that was used to clean the aircraft. They have a number of TCE plumes on Patrick Air Force Base. So if this isn't out of the realm of possibility. And lastly, say my yard tested, had, via, had testing by the EPA, and they found chloroform, bromo, dichlorinated yeah, ethylene, and one last thing, and dioxane, and a sweet smell consistent with TCE. So we may be dealing with TCE plumes here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Any additional non-resident comments? Okay, hearing none, bring it back to council, and we'll move on to the proclamation provided by Mindy on declaring October 25 through November 1st as Mobility Week 2019. Ms.
wanted me to just say a, a few words about some of the things that are going on for Mobility Week. Um, and actually, we're going to be back in Satellite Beach at, at Cardi Park for one of the RRFPs during Mobility Week doing some outreach and education again. There's a Ride with Jim event, which I have not had the pleasure of going on, but if you if you have not been on one, um, there were some flyers. Do we have any extra? There, yeah, there are some flyers and some information circulating around if you had any questions about how to sign up for that event. We're doing a big event in Titusville. Um, it's geared towards seniors. There'll be some Halloween uh, trunk or tree activities going on at different places. And, it, and like you read in the resolution, it's just a week to maybe try a different form of transportation that you haven't, haven't done before. If you haven't gotten out on your bike in a long time, get out and you know, go for a ride or go for a nice walk and get on the bus and just you know, try, try something different. It's to, to bring awareness to all of that. And I was also told to mention Vision Zero. Um, Vision Zero is, is an initiative that has actually been around 20 plus years. It started overseas. And it's centered around the idea that the only acceptable number of traffic deaths is zero. And uh, we have adopted, the TPO has adopted the resolution and also uh, approved a work order for us to develop an action plan. And at the end of that action plan, we'll um, have toolkits that will come back to the municipalities we'll, that will give them guidance on how they can implement Vision Zero strategies. And we're going to do our best to eliminate all serious crashes and, and fatalities in, in this county. And a lot of that involves our most vulnerable road users, which are motorcyclists, bicyclists, and pedestrians. And if you'd like, I could speak a little to the A1A corridor. Would you like me to address the A1A sure, corridor? Sure. Since there was a question on it. The A1A corridor, actually, we have done so, or FDOT, it's their road, has done so many pieces, um, studies here, there, and they're like, wait a minute. <laughs> There's just too much confusion. Satellite Beach is interested in Indian Harbor Beach is interested in lowering their speed limits, getting them down more in line with Cocoa Beach and their 35 mile an hour limit. So FDOT's current thinking, and, and I think they're pretty close to going ahead with studying the A1A corridor the, the entirety in Brevard County and looking and then coming back and telling the municipalities and everybody involved what needs to happen to get speed limits lowered, to make improvements so the whole corridor is safe. So I don't know who you tried to get a hold of at FDOT, but there it is being looked at. Yeah, the last time I spoke with the District 5 Secretary, he was he wanted to, when we wanted the sidewalk fill-ins on the west side, he wanted to, to address that in that study. So um, it seemed like they were moving forward with it the last time I was right. They just, you know, I mean, there's just been a lot of little stuff yeah. going on. So they just said, hey, let's just. Let's and they just had to finish thing. stuff before they started that. That was mm -hmm. the other thing is they, they wanted to finish some of the improvements and study them before they went into the next study mm -hmm. because they wanted to see the results and, you know, where they really needed to concentrate additional sidewalks, additional lighting, stuff like that and, you know, have some data before they moved into the study. So that's kind of what And I do know they, they developed yeah. a survey tool to come in and question folks about the effectiveness of the RRB, RFDs right. that you guys have in place already. And, of course, the second set of those is going in. But there are other improvements that were planned that are actually kind of being mm -hmm. held up until this, uh, this quarter study can, can happen. But it will be A1A in its entirety. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councilwoman Gibson, thank you for reading the proclamation. Appreciate it. All right, let's move on to city council comments, and we'll give Joey a break tonight, and not make her go first. We'll pick on Dominic. Dominic, go first. Uh, I attended the Space Coast League of Cities meeting Monday night, and that's all I have. All right, thank you, sir. Ms. Gibson. Um, I attended the Space Coast Transportation Planning Organization meeting, and this. Some of, there's been some concerns out there, and they don't necessarily directly affect Satellite Beach because we don't have, the, we already have the um, crosswalks. But I just kind of want to address uh, an email that was sent to me just so there, if there are people out there listening that I know a lot of us are being affected because of the commute to and from work. And 
And I'd like to just express the need for, you know, a little bit of patience. Um, you know, it never is fun whenever there is construction. And um, their initial rollout of, of the, the barrels obviously was not <laughs> not effective. But what, what I appreciate is that FDOT did um, listen to the concerns of the citizens. And boy, they got them um, left and right. And they have made changes. In case you haven't noticed, they broke it up into three sections now. Um, the initial concerns were that, you know, you have this long linear um, forever line of, of barrels and they're halfway into the lane. I mean, you see people hitting them left and right. And, um, and then there was also not a pull-off area for um, first responders to be able to get by. So there was some concern about that. So they appear to have addressed them. Um, I did have a conversation with, um, what was her name? Anna, Anna Taylor. And I expressed to her, you know, even breaking into three sections, I'm not, you know, entirely comfortable with with even that for the traffic flow because they are only working one section at a time. So the other two sections sit and they're not being used, but for the effectiveness of getting it done quickly, um, they have the barrels up. So I guess as citizens, we always can express our concerns to FDOT, but um, you have to take into consideration that she did say that they would be open to taking those away and putting them up as they work those sections, but that would make the process take a lot longer. So. When you're questioning FDOT or you're contacting them, you want to take that into consideration. Um, what is more important to you, to get it done quickly um, or, you know, have, be more, have it more convenient? So um, other than that, I attended the Space Coast League of Cities dinner as well, and I think that's it. I'm not sure. I turned 21 again yesterday. So there's that. Mm -hmm. um, but anyways, that's it. <laughs> the 20 <laughs> <laughs> All right, Councilwoman Zicky. I have nothing. I with the League of Cities. Okay. With them, so. All I have is I would like to thank our, um, open this up, oh. our fire yeah. department for the shirt. That's very kind of you guys to do that. Thank you guys. You know how much I thank you all. That was very kind of to get that. I know Dominic got one too. I got one too. Oh, maybe got one. Oh, we got one. And we all got one. All right. So That's thank you guys, ladies and gentlemen, for this. Appreciate it very much. It was very kind of you all to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but I got the hat first. <laughs> We're waiting for something from Alan. Alan's got to come up with something. <laughs> there you go. Can I take like a forklift maybe for when I want to move stuff around? Just all shovels will help. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, let's move on to city attorney report. Nothing. Okay, we'll move on to city manager report. All right. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, we have upcoming our, on November 2nd, Saturday, at, from 9 to 3, we have our annual Founders Day and Marketplace at the DRS Community Center and the Soda Parade. So we look forward to that. It's my favorite time of year. Um, I received a thank you letter from Stephanie Hill thanking the fire department for above and beyond help, and I wanted to read it. I know it's a little lengthy, but um, I'm hoping that I can get through it without choking up. So um, it's, it's very, um, it just describes what an incredible job our fire department does, and the personal um, relationship that they, you know, have with all of our residents is just amazing. And um, so I, it, it's very important that I think everybody hears this. It says, Dear Ms. Barker, this letter has been two years in the making as I search for just the right set of words to convey my most profound gratitude to a very special group of people. Though I realize that a simple thank you note could never be enough, I would like to take a few moments to share my experience and explain why I feel so fortunate to reside in our town. September 29, 2017 began just as any other normal day at my condo in Satellite Beach. After returning from a walk along the ocean that morning, I started to get ready for work. When a sudden headache struck the left side of my brain, it quickly became apparent that I was having a massive stroke. Within seconds, my entire right side was paralyzed, and I was unable to speak. Lying on the floor, unable to move, my thoughts turned to the fact that my three children, ages 18, 20, and 22, would soon be coping with the loss of their mother after losing their father just five years earlier. As luck would have it, my daughter Jessica happened to be home that day, and she found me on the floor within a few minutes. She immediately called 911, and the Satellite Beach Fire Department and Police Department arrived almost instantly, instantaneously. The first responders acted with such speed, skill, and compassion that I can say with absolute certainty they made the crucial difference in the outcome that day. I was rushed to homes where a team of neurologists was able to remove the clot in time to reverse all of the effects. If, I hadn't been, if it hadn't been for the quick actions of the first responders in Satellite Beach, I likely would not have survived. 
We are so fortunate to have the team from Satellite Beach Fire Department led by Chief Dave Abernathy and the team from Satellite Beach PD led by Chief Jeff Pearson. Chief Abernathy happens to be the person I remember most from that day two years ago. Not only did he go above and beyond to lead the team for my care, but he also recognized the need to ensure the safety and well-being of my extremely distraught daughter. After I was loaded into the ambulance, he turned his attention to making sure that Jessica made it safely to the hospital in time to make critical care decisions on my behalf. Several days later, when I returned from the IC home from the ICU, there was a beautiful card waiting for me from the entire Satellite Beach Fire Department team who helped me that day. Words cannot adequately express how grateful I am for all the very dedicated first responders who were there in my time of need. Members of the fire department and the police department soon came back to my building to see how I was doing and to make some improvements to the condo access for first responders. The men and women from both departments are truly exceptional. In a day and age where negative press seems to get all the attention, I think it's important to share the stories of triumph that play out every single day in our community. There are so many heroes hiding in plain sight here in Satellite Beach. My heartfelt thanks go out to all of them and also to you all for all that you do to make Satellite Beach a wonderful place to live. That's cool. And on, on uh, duty that day, that was uh, Matt Hawley, Nick Walsh, Jay Dragon, and Darren Blake. He was on duty that day. Yeah, so I think, you know, that just, it, I, we passed that letter around City Hall and there wasn't a dry eye after after reading that. And, and you know, when you're a mom, that's what you think of, you know, so. Um, so, you know, everything else I have is just boring now. So, um, <laughs> the uh, East Central Florida Regional Planning Council will be celebrating the commitment of the regions, um, county, cities, and government agencies to the East Central uh, Florida Resilience Collaborative, and then we'll be hosting a signing ceremony on Wednesday, October 23rd at 1 o'clock. And I'll leave there, and my staff, uh, Julie and Finch, will be there to, to represent the city, and if any of you would like to go, let me know. Um, Councilman Gibson and I will be traveling to Washington, D.C. from October 21st through the 24th. We're arranging right now with our lobbyists um, to meet with several um, legislators to talk about PFOS legislation. Um, and then the Sustainability Board will be hosting a solar expo at the Civic Center at 565 Cassia Boulevard on Saturday, November 23rd from 9 to 2, and they will present on solar technologies and funding. And so that's a pretty cool event. So that we're, we're trying to bring all of the people or um, you know, agencies and companies that provide solar and put it in one place and basically walk residents through putting solar on their, on their properties. Um, and then I just wanted to respond to the uh, arsenic issue. Yeah. We, if you read that report, you'll see that one of the sites that tested above the residential cleanup standards for arsenic was actually um, the site that was tested before the sand was put down. And then one tested higher after the sand was put down. So there's areas no, no, across, no, 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 no. there are areas across Florida that have background levels of arsenic that are much higher than the residential cleanup standard. That is a fact. And I understand that, you know, people get upset when in fact don't agree with their opinions, but that's a fact. And so that study um, is not on our website because we've had to take down multiple items from our website since the studies are not ADA compliant. So that is why they're not available on the website. Anybody can come into City Hall and request it. Um, and then I wanted to let uh, Chief Pearson to give updates on um, some of the, the uh, crime arrests that he's been making. So they're really good stories. <laughs> yeah, we uh, uh, thank you, uh, yes, Mayor and Councilwoman, and the opportunity to talk to you. Uh, clearly, the, the community knows that the beach side in Northern Palm Bay is hit pretty hard with uh, car burglaries and car thefts, mm -hmm. which is obviously very unusual. That, that kind of stuff. Every once in a blue moon, we'll have something um, like that happen on the beach side, but not that often when you have a, a rash, if you will, like that, um, it, it obviously uh, causes concern. So I wanted to give a new update and, and in chronological order of what happened, because of course the end is, is, is the good part. Um, it's just a really good thing for the end of that, because this would be good to be there to know the community. Uh, it started with the 
we have to move closer. So in August, we had two vehicles stolen from Grant Avenue in a one week period. No, no known suspects in time or anything. One vehicle was located in North Satellite Beach. Another was located by Sergeant Owens, who's on a traffic stop on South Patrick, and just happened to look up and see a tow truck coming down the street with a car in the back, and recognized that that happens to be stolen car from the city from two days ago. That's pretty impressive right off the bat. So because of that, he's able to find out where it was to get more information and you know, can't write to you because it was stolen in South Africa, so it's on the North Side, so it's in the jurisdiction. So in September, then, we had um, four burglaries in Huntington Coast, and the suspects were caught on the radio in one of the residents, but we couldn't identify the people, we didn't recognize them, and the video wasn't clear enough to, to uh, make ID just, just on a uh, photograph. So then we had some residential burglaries on Maple and Sugar, and the homeowner on Maple was a little disturbed, it was a little disturbing because she was in her house and heard her doorbell go off that she has when the door opens. So she's like, why is the front door chime going right in the middle of the night? So she sits up in the bed and she happens to see a flashlight through the crack of her bedroom door right now. And then of course the flashlight stops, shines in the window, she freaks out, her husband wakes up, of course it takes off. Well, that doesn't happen to me. <laughs> when all these things are going on and the description that she gave, which was they matched what we saw on the ring camera, matched the you know, it's just, it's just, it's just the time. So of course we had the, the canine out, we had the helicopter out, looking, trying to do uh, best we could to find the person, just couldn't get any information that night. So then we ended up to find the vehicle where on jail coach and Margarita, coincidentally, right? And then we found that a stolen vehicle from another was recovered by the coach road, and then a stolen vehicle from coach road was abandoned in Maple. So now we're, we're seeing what's going on here. So as it turns out, you know, everything's the same, the vandals are the same, the stolen vehicles are the same, or even similar types of vehicles. And the pattern started to emerge. That's when uh, Grand House decided to do some crime analysis. You know, old school, get the crime out, get the kids out, and really figure out exactly who's doing what and where they're going. Which, by the way, would be a lot of fun for the judge to judge. He's been here 33 years, so I think it's old school sometimes. So, come to find out, one of the vehicles that was uh, stolen from Maple was recovered on Maple Drive, and one that was stolen from Sherwood was recovered at Tom Tindall. Well, we found out that the, the three suspects, juveniles, were arrested at Tom Tindall. But because they committed all these crimes, nobody could catch up with them quite yet because they're all happening so fast, and you have to build cases. You can't just go, well, it's probably you, so you know, you're charged. I mean, it's not a horse. So the judge just let them go. said, well, I don't know what's going on, so see you later, bye. And off they went from back to Mark County, and then coincidentally, it only stopped for the duration of the time that they were incarcerated from Bob Miller to when I got back home and then started again that night. So, in the early morning hours, now in late September, a homeowner in Jamaica it comes out in the middle of the night because he's hungry on so Wednesday. So, he walks out and he sees some juveniles in his neighbor's car. So, he's like, oh, man, so he calls, goes kind of to the back side, calls 911. We get there, we're looking. The officer gets there talking with the person that made the call. One of the officers sees a vehicle going 100 miles an hour on the Westbound Avenue, so it's like 100 miles an hour. Well, obviously, we're not going to pursue that, that vehicle. That's, that's reckless and crazy. So um, he was trying to follow, trying to get the best description he could, couldn't get it down or anything. Come to find out, we were done with the person on, on uh, Jamaica. He got his car to go to Wendy's, and as he was driving down the street, the stolen vehicle passed him. And he looked at him like, hey, that's my neighbor's truck. Well, it was. It was the one that was stolen when he scared him out of, out of the car. They stole the one next door to him. So that car ended up crashing into a, a woman, an older woman, who was sitting uh, at Pogali in South Patrick, waiting to make a left turn on the South Patrick to go north. And the vehicle was going so fast, hit with such force that it pushed her into the bank parking lot. Oh. That, that ran the car out to where it didn't make it much over the bridge, and then they abandoned it. And they took off on foot. Well, the mother gets the call, they get the helicopter, and the dog's out there, we're finding the wood there. So the conclusion is the, 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 the interesting part. So now they're arrested. Now they're charged with a couple of things we just had. They've got the pending from Hot Simple, but that's it. But we all know, in the other night, Scott Left Beach, the Academy, Barbara and Bombay, all know that that spree that's been going on is all that. We know that. But we only have some cases that we can put together fast enough to, to get there. So the Manor House decided, Let's do something a little different. So he got his detectives to get with other agencies to get their detectives to go to the, to the first appearance. No, 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 no,
that and organize that and get it there in front of the judge absolutely stops what would be more more victims of this whole law cars or burglars or whatever. So I just thought that was that was worth maybe worth trying to explain to that as a city manager in our staff and um, she also agreed that it would be a good idea to let you all know in the community as well. Um, and then the second report I have is um, we just put out on social media, which is and I've just gotten an addition of it. She hasn't even got even heard yet, which I is 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 uh, really it's really good to hear. To hear. So Officer Martinez at three in the morning is doing business checks. You know, every night we do business checks uh, twice once business is first closed, once before the first open. You know, Officer Wall was driving around through there, but he looks up and sees a sign of a tractor and an SUV at the gas station that anybody knows about. So she's kind of looking at it, she's checking to see why they're there, they're doing this unusual time. And the semi truck takes off, he gets the tag on it, and the SUV, the driver of the SUV jumps in the car and, and takes off. So he stops the SUV, and on the front passenger seat is a motherboard with a swarm stand on it. Mm-hmm. So he calls up um, our canine officer, Amber Clay, and says, hey, go to, go to the open box and see what you see in there. Let me know to see if, if it matches up. So while he's talking to him, she, she radios to him, obviously out of your side of the driver, and says, yeah, this is exactly what it looks like in that there. So he asks to kind of search the car, while apparently thinking that, that his explanation for what's the motherboard when the officer asked him, he said, oh, it's just for my computer, I fixed computers. He figured the cop on it, so, and then he said, well, do you have anything you leave in the car? I find this resume, it's not a normal thing. We don't take the search, and he gives consent to search, and we find that, and of course it matches up with what's in the box. So the detective blew the thing out, recognized that that's, that's a pretty high-tech uh, skimming device. So she called the forensic team at the Department of Sheriff's Office. That's the motor practice, the 431. But because everybody's going to take it so bad, I mean, the, the forensic detective called back over 15 minutes and said, if you think you caught a skimmer in the act, then that would be right there. So they came out and absolutely proved, confirmed it. So that person was arrested. And they're in the process of getting a search warrant for the skimming device for the vehicle and for the, the driver's phone. Um, and in the car, there was a whole set of keys that, come to find out, matched several of the boxes to the mobile station um, gas pumps, and there was a whole range of probably 25 other keys that went to Lord knows how many gas pump boxes all around wherever. Because this person's in South Florida. I mean, not even, not even from any other cabin, not even from, it's you know, farther than two hours away from coming up to, uh, to, to do this. So, literally just, what, two hours ago, two and a half hours ago, I got this uh, email from the sheriff's office from uh, Sheriff Ivy. I don't want to read the whole thing. The important part here, I just wanted to read this paragraph here that I've already done. Um, Chief Pierce, I'd like to personally thank Paul Officer Martinez and Officer Clay for catching the identi- and identifying the suspect. No other law enforcement officer or law enforcement agency in Brevard County has ever caught a skimmer layer suspect during the installation process of a car reader. The actions of these officers provide our unit with valuable information regarding a larger skimmer organization. This was a breakthrough our economic crimes task force needed to move forward with our case. I respectfully recommend that Officer Martinez and Officer Clay be considered for Officer Obama. That's, that's pretty significant. <laughs> we have the sheriff sending the letter um, and the economics criminal uh, investigator, so it's the economics crime unit, started sending me a letter saying that no one's done that, no one's been able to do it, and that's the breakthrough they need on a much larger scale that you know, we don't have the ability to, or the staffing to, to handle, and they do and try. And it's just nice to know that, that in the middle of the night, we're all stupid, but there's, there's people out there you know, looking out for things mm-hmm. and protecting us. So I thought that was uh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> What, what happened with the semi? So did you guys have the plates on it? Or? Yeah, I don't, I don't think that's what I would have done. It's an after the station, so Interesting. the questions I can answer might be somewhat limited. Oh, I got that. That makes sense. I don't really know that. Okay. okay. Would it be appropriate to recognize them here at the council meeting, at an available council meeting? Yeah, I would, I would ask if it's all right to, to, if we could just hold up a little bit to kind of see where this goes, because the, the more publicity it gets, you know, I want it to, to jeopardize it. Right. The larger scale investigation mm-hmm. that you're talking about. Um, when you think it's appropriate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm already controlled because Brad's already accepted I put it on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, I'm wondering really, like, that, like, well, I, I want people to know that this is a big one. Okay. Well, we, we did talk about it. So. Well, like, um, 
I said we'll wait on your time. Yeah, if, if you don't mind, I, I appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you don't want to do that. I just want to make sure that's right. very good. It also lets our public know that while your people are out there working, there's also people out there breaking the law at that hour of the morning. So, you know, um, we're cognizant yeah. that they're out there, and we appreciate everything your people do. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you for awesome police work all the way around. The earlier car break-ins and car burglaries. Keys in the car? Cars unlocked? And every single case in every single city was an unlocked car and a key If the car was stolen, the key it. If it was burglarized, it was a door. Every single one. Homeowner unlocked door? Homeowner unlocked door? Oh, yeah. Um, the interesting part is one of the vehicles that was left open, the husband and I actually know him, he called me, he said upset, and I thought he was upset because, you know, his car was stolen. So it turns out that he had his wife's keys in his car, and he left his car open. Hers was locked up tight. So they found the keys, didn't know the car was open, and went, oh, it's hers, it's still her car. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 that's, I mean, that's probably a good reminder to people that we, we are a very safe city, but other people come to our city who are not good people. And, and by the way, we did find the twice car in Boston that it was not damaged because they found it to see one of them. Chiefs, and they, one of them had the garage door opener in the car, and that's how they got in the house. Yeah. yeah. yeah the, the car was open, the garage door opener opened the garage, and the door to the garage that goes in the house was locked. Right. The front door was locked, so I guess I missed okay. it. Okay. I'm sorry. No, I mean, yeah, but that makes sense. The front door itself was locked. Okay. That access is not active. Yeah. That's pretty bold. I mean, when you said earlier that like you stopped them from stealing other cars, I think I think it would have slowly progressed into something much more nefarious than just stealing cars and driving 100 miles an hour in a neighborhood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They better not ever come to my house. <laughs> Just gonna say that right now. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Nope. Thank you. So um, I just have one action item, and that is uh, the Southeast Sustainability Directors Network is helping support efforts to extend the solar investment tax credit, and they're encouraging the southeastern mayors to consider signing the Solar Energy Industries Association's multi-mayoral letter calling on Congress to extend the tax credit, um, and, and basically, you know, we just kind of explain what the tax credit is, but it's basically the major tool that homeowners use to, to put solar on their homes. So uh -huh. we're um, just asking for your permission to allow the mayor to sign that letter. I'll make a motion to approve the uh, sending of that letter. Second. Motion by Council Montanero, second by Councilwoman Gibson to allow, the permit, or encourage the mayor, mayor to sign the letter. Uh, additional discussion among council? Hearing none at this time since it's an action item. I'll open it for public comment. Is there any public comment on this action item? Hearing none, bring it back to council. Okay. Councilman Yes. Councilman Gibson? Yes. Councilman Yes. Vice Mayor Yes. Motion passes unanimously. And I just have one other announcement. Um, Gail Meredith, one of our, our resident that passed, yeah. um, her funeral is this Saturday at 10.30. And if you would like the um, details of that, just let me know and I'll, I'll send it over to you. Anything else for the city manager? Okay. Um, just one, just one thing. I, I know what Cassie. You always want to know when we're gonna, if we're gonna be at the founder's day. I'm personally gonna be there, so count me in. Got two. I'll be there, but I have to go really quick because I. Three. I'm committed. Yeah. I'll be there for the second one. Yeah, four out of five. We never know about this. So. I'll be there. I'll be there. <laughs> I'll be there. All right. Let's move on to agenda item number eight, which is a consent agenda, which we can entertain as a consent agenda or break it out. The only thing that uh, I have for you guys is that the city attorney has requested that on action item A, we he read the resolution. How would you like to act on this, guys? I would like to make a motion to approve it after he reads it. Okay. Second. Okay. Motion, motion by Councilman Montanero, second by Councilwoman Gibson. Resolution number 1019, a resolution of the City of Satellite Beach, Brevard County, Florida, in support of Florida House of Representative Bill, House of Representatives Bill 141, regarding water quality improvements. Okay. Any discussion or questions before we move on? 
Okay, at this time, this is a consent agenda I, items 8A and B. Is there any public comment regarding action items A or B as a consent agenda? Okay, hearing none, bring it back to council. Anything else, council? Okay. Councilman Yes. Councilman Yes. Councilman Montero? Yes. Yes, motion passes unanimously. Let's move on to agenda item number nine, uh, proposed changes to the bond fire permit program and fees. Courtney. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Liz is going to help us present this item. Um, start. <laughs>
Oh, go ahead. I just wanted to add that the reason why we started this um, review was because we had a resident walk in the beach in the morning and step in a, in a hot fire that was just covered over with sand. And even though the agreement with the bonfire permit holders um, requires them to put it out, douse it out with water, which there's a very large source right there, they, they this group and it happens quite often they just cover it with sand and it just smolders and somebody actually stepped in it and injured himself. Um, so with with those issues in mind, we wanted to make sure that we could pinpoint the person who's having the fire with what is left there in the morning and that because we don't have them demarcated, that's been a problem for us. Um, we also thought that with the deposit we would have a better um, ability to, you know, that's, you know, you, sometimes you just have to hit people in the pockets to make them behave, and that's um, basically what the, the intent of that is. And so um, we have that same process with all of our other rental facilities, and it's the same thing. We're, we're having to clean up. The public works department cleans up quite a bit of debris during bonfire season in the mornings and um, tries to get it done before people are out there walking, but sometimes can't get there in time. And it's just, you know, the amount of work that we're putting into it, the fee is not covering what we're, what we're putting into it. So 20% um, of the bonfire permit holders are city residents. The rest are not. So that's why we wanted to make sure that it was a fee-based system and not covered under property taxes so that our residents are not subsidizing the um, other people that don't live in the city. And this is just another example of the concerted effort that our departments look at as a group and come up with, I mean, when I first saw this and read it, I went, wow, this is pretty, this is pretty good. Um, it covers everything you need to cover. And I'm glad that your people are getting some of this, you know, for the, the work that they're going to be doing, cleaning up some of this stuff. Um, you know, I've used for various organizations, uh, you know, our facilities and paid the deposit in the past. And, you know, if you clean it up, you get the deposit back. So, you know, for $50, um, they're getting to enjoy something that they're going to do. And like you said, a lot of this is people that come from outside our city. So um, it's great that they have the ability of doing that here in Satellite Beach. But at the same time, they need to be responsible to clean it up. And, and I think this is just a great example of all of you working together to bring forth this recommendation because it covers pretty much everything. Thank you. I have a couple of questions and a possible suggestion. Um, are, the, are the restrooms at like Pelican and Hightower Tower open all the time? Mm -hmm. Are they open in the evenings for bonfires? Yeah, they're open for certain. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry. They're open for uh, a certain amount of time. The police department locks them when they have an opportunity. Okay. So you can't really know when there are folks still on the beach having a bonfire. And, and the problem with leaving the restrooms open is you have more opportunity for vandalism and they, um, what in, in some situations, um, actually Paul Turkey uh, found folks taking toilet paper out of the restrooms to use as kindling for their huh. bonfires. They couldn't get it going, so they just decided to take toilet paper out of there and that, and that was their, their fire start. And also, so, um, so those are the challenges that we have with keeping the restrooms open. We would love to keep the restrooms open all the time, but there's more opportunity for problems. Right. I would, I would say, with the increase in price, it might be nice if 
somebody was at Pelican or Hightower that they knew for sure the bathrooms would be open until 9 or 10. Like, I think that's... They like try and do it after 10, 10 right? Well, is it late later? Okay. It's usually like, okay, that's... Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, right. Mm-hmm. It's per bonfire, right? Not like a seasonal charge. It's per bonfire, right? Um, the part about cleaning up, and I was reading the use agreement, and it says recreation fire sites must be fully cleaned prior to departure. My suggestion might be maybe a list of your expectations because some people doing a bonfire might not know how to fully clean up, like what your expectation is. In order to get your money back, we expect these things to occur. Mm-hmm. So maybe just a couple of bullet points mm-hmm. of expectations. Yeah, that's a right thing. Yeah, like fire out. Right. Oh, yeah, that's a right. Pick up all the trash. You know, leave the beach. Like, so that know it's somewhere already? Like, don't we already have that? Mm. Like, the rules, isn't there rules like you can't burn? Some people think, like, you know, well, glass is made out of sand, so I can do my glass. Yeah, I mean, honestly, like, the, the stretch people do, you know, to justify. But I, and it, you know, and, and I have to echo Alan's words because I have seen the pictures of what those restrooms look like after some of these bonfires. And, yeah. and I mean, you know, I feel like giving Paul Furphy a raise just for having to deal with that one restroom because they are really bad sometimes. And so we, we did start that where we started closing them at, at 10, you know, to open them for the bonfires. Um, but, you know, there is the, especially when there's a younger crowd. Mm-hmm. And then would the signs be posted actually on the beach, like up at the dune line? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. So that would be. I was going to say that as well. I was going to say that um, because we were talking about the time, the, the instructions that we were talking about, even after 10 o'clock, it's going to be more than one. Yeah. Sometimes it will be more than one, sometimes it's 10 o'clock, okay. something like that. But, but they're, not, but they're not close so to 7 or 8. There's no way right. that, that we could have opened all that. No, and I don't think that you should either. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I just want to say, we, we spent an evening in Tallahassee going over this, going around some circles with some wine in our system, and you guys, I, Liz, I'm super impressed with what you did, because there was a lot of, like, I don't know if we can do this, and I don't know if we're going to be able to do that, and Cassie, you guys, I think you really, because we, we, we were just having lots of angry discussion, because it was very frustrating that, you know, you have a beachgoer, almost we were concerned about being sued, he had, like, second-degree burns on his feet, because he stepped on this ember walking on the beach in the morning, I mean, you should feel safe, you know, walking on the beach and not get burned, I mean, other than hot sand at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, you know, so I think you guys did an excellent job. I mean, Jody, those were really good suggestions, by the way, um, and, you know, thank you so much because, you know, we're going to get paid back for our time spent, and I think it's really going to deter, you know, it, you know, when you have some teen, yes, there are some families or younger teenagers that have, you know, maybe families with more money, but it might be less inclined to, you know, be willing to spend the money you knowing you're going to lose it. Mm-hmm. And then also we can hold them accountable because we know who they are. And then maybe, is there something in there about if they have too many strikes against them, they can no longer... Okay. And then also with transferring it from fire to rec for the permitting process, that leaves fire open for more monitoring, which is what we wanted to do is increase their ability to monitor the, the sites more. And that's kind of their, you know, the regulatory aspect is where they're, you know, that just increasing those efficiencies. So the rec is departments, you know, they rent out facilities every day, and, you know, the fire department has that regulatory arm, so we thought that that would be a better fit moving it that direction. Well, good job, you guys. Thank you. I'll make a motion to approve the proposed changes to the fire department's bond fire permit program and fees and or provide and fees. Dominic, does that include the suggestions that uh, Joe yes. made as well? Yes, yeah, including all right, Liz. Yep. Okay. Yep. Second. Second. We have a motion by Councilman Montanero and second by Councilwoman um, Gibson for approval of agenda item number nine. At this time, I'll open the public comment portion of agenda item number nine. Diane, come on up. Thank you. I live near Pelican, and I'm excited about this, but I do want to share thoughts that I've had over the years during the bonfires. Natural wood not ones that are soaked in poison. If we can put that in there, I have to close my windows on my house because the chemical smell is so bad. The lighter fluid, I don't know if you've given us any thought, but it's awful, just awful. So if we can somehow put natural firewood 
and as opposed to okay good good Yeah, I have to close my windows a lot. Mm -hmm. So like during winter, it just is, it, it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, then the other thing is like, if it's gonna be a thing, and then of course on um, sustainability and all that, and here's back to the chipper mulcher, but anyway, doing the wood, gathering the wood, if we had our wood and you guys wanna do, do a wood pile, you could sell it. So, or something like that, I don't know. But you know, if, you know, I mean, just to put it out there, so, you know, when we do tree cleanup or whatever, but you'd have to have arborists so that, you know, which ones to do. So you're not, you know, doing, um, what's that called? Oleander mm -hmm. to anybody. So, yeah. So, <laughs> all right. So I just have to put that up there all the time. Okay, thanks. Thanks, honey. Yeah. This one public health. Yeah, well, and again, Terry Park, I was taking some notes about this. Uh, I have a couple of concerns, but I think all around this is probably not such a bad thing. Uh, my, my first concern is, are we now going to be paying, I, I go to a bonfire every year, we always clean up after ourselves, follow all the rules, I'm a resident, and I, I would bet that most residents do. Uh, are we now going to be paying $150 up front versus $25? Right, but there's also $100 deposit, so... Mm -hmm. Okay, so up front it's 150, and then you get 100 back. Okay. The, yeah, I'm, I'm not so I'm not so um, against that. That's actually not a bad idea. There's people to account, and the, the liability agreement I, I understand that as well. Not so bad. Um, resident discounts. Is there a possibility of getting discounts for residents? You mentioned that uh, the majority of these permits are from out of the city. Uh, I, I'd be willing to bet that the majority of those out-of-cityers are the ones that are, that are causing the problems. They're not following the rules. And I'd be willing to bet that the majority of the people in the city are following the rules because we live here and we don't want to walk on the beach and step in hot embers. Uh, I, I'd, be, um, I'd, I'd be thrilled to see that, um, that recognition passed on to the residents in the form of a discount for us. Uh, Bathrooms, I'm glad you brought that up, thank you. Uh, those bathrooms were closed at 9 p.m. last year uh, at Papagallos, I believe it was, the, the Sunset Beach Access. I went down there every year, like I go to a beach fire, and barely after sunset, I had to go use bathroom. Bathrooms were closed. We're gonna have, we're gonna have problems with, I mean, if people can't use the bathroom, what are, what are they gonna do? Bathrooms. First of all, Shell Street no longer has fire um, uh, on fires. On fires. So um, Shell Street is closed. I presume that's probably due to the Papagallos thing. I don't know what that is. I don't have any You know, I think last year Papagallos had some conflicts between parking and, and things like that. So I'm not going to do that. But okay. I can tell you that the, the restrooms are on timer. And the timer uh, closes, blocks the restroom at 10 o'clock. Only at six in the morning, and they, they um, turn the shower off and lock the door at ten o'clock. Okay, so the bathrooms are automatically locked. You might want to check and make sure those clocks are being set on daylight savings mm -hmm. nights properly. Yeah, do it every 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 time the time changes. We want it every six months. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Mark, can I just address the uh, yep. resident rate? Um, the reason why we have standard rates in our city, even for all of our athletic programs, is that we have agreements with the county. And at one point in time, Public and Beach Park and Hightower were both county parks. And part of our agreements with the county is to have standardized rates for not only our athletic programs, but everything else that we do. So um, while I understand your concern, um, you know, the agreements that we have with the county is that our rates would be a structured rate for everybody. So it's just, um, it's just the way the agreement is that we've had. And for us to do something like that, um, I think would be sending the wrong message um, to the agreement that we have with the county. That is correct, though. Yeah, you're right. 
Is that a permanent agreement now, or is there a time it's limit to it? It's in place for, I mean, I, I remember David talking so about it for years, that, you know, this is what we do with our recreation programs, mm -hmm. whether it's with Little League or anything else. So, um, you know, there's there's been a precedent set, and I don't think we should deviate. The other, the other thing too is it's a fee. It's a fee-based program. So if there is some subsidizing of the property with property taxes, then I can understand giving a discount to residents because you know they're already paying for it. But in this instance, we have designed this for the fee to cover the cost of the program itself. So, so in that instance, it's you know if you're if you're not paying for the bonfire program unless you're using it. Okay. Any additional public comments, Steve? Steve Osmer, Cinnamon Drive. Um, I was approached by a few people and got a few phone calls on this. Uh, I will say for the majority it was all good. Uh, I think the only thing that came to mind was the $100 deposit. Um, as people say, that's your outline from the beginning is $150 compared to when we just went from $25, that's a $125 jump in one year as opposed to would the council consider maybe only having a $50 deposit this year, see if that corrects, rectifies the problems that we're having. If it doesn't, then I think you have justification to say, yes, we definitely want a $100 deposit to it. And if it works, then you leave it at $50, only because there are a lot of younger families here, or you can have some younger groups, church groups, or things like that, again, that need to come out with that initial outlay of that. So, again, just, just as a thought, um, I, again, everybody that I've talked to and mentioned it, definitely agree with, yes, um, it should pay for itself. Yes, we want responsible people, people who really want to have the bonfire, not just throw a party on the beach. Those are the folks who really want to come down there and enjoy that. Um, but again, you want to make sure that it is an equal opportunity for everybody, every resident of every economic background to have an opportunity to come do that. And again, just from one year of $25 to $150 just from one season to another is quite a bit of a jump. But either way, I support it, but I just wanted to pass on that as that was some of the words that I got from residents. Thank you. Um, Two questions I'm going to ask. Um, the $100 deposit, is it cash and then returned back? It is cash. So they're out, they are out, of, it's not just being held. So they're, they are out 150 right from the start. And the $100 deposit is pretty, that's the standard for? Okay. But it will get charged to It gets charged and then it gets, right, right. So, yeah, if they only have $75 in there bank account, like they can't, like it's not just being held. Um, okay, and then um, the hundred dollar deposit, that's standard for any rental facility. That's for the clubhouse, which we just did last year, 200. All the rest of our facilities are all So would you feel that the, the upkeep and the cleanup of a bonfire is equitable to the upkeep and cleanup of one of the pavilions? Mm -hmm. Would you consider those pretty equal? Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. I want to make a comment on that. I think, you know, when you're looking at deposits, you're looking at what the cost is to fix any damage, you know, so typically like the staff time and all that, and, and I think everyone here is pretty sure that we love our beaches, and I really don't think there can be a price tag added to what is left there, the trash that is left there, the plastics, the contaminations, of whatever, the lighter fluids and all that, and I think $100 is is a fair price to ask for people to be responsible and they, they're going to be a little bit more considerate of it um, because we, you know, there, there is no price that can be attached to the value of that. Um, and um, I appreciate that some people might not, and I understand that, I mean, I've, I've been there in my lifetime, but uh, the end of the day is, is that we do have our own residents are destroying. I, I actually had, had some teenagers on my street that I know for a fact were trashing the beach and of course had words with them so um you know it's I, I would not be okay with taking it any lower than 100. i would almost be okay with going a little bit higher personally mm -hmm. yep. So 
what we could do to try to address that concern, though, is, you know, like, when we were starting this November 1st, if you approve it, and we could come back to you maybe February 1st with a report to see if any, that's bond season, right? You know, so it starts in November. It ends at the end of February. So we could come back in March to let you know if the permit number dropped, which would be an indication that it's too expensive, okay. um, and let you know. And then if that's the case, then we can move to a different strategy. But um, that's usually, the, and, you know, and that, that might help address some of that. I, I, I kind of look at this, you know, we take credit cards now, and they're never going to get billed. It's going to get credited back to them before it even shows up on a bill. So, I mean, if the majority of people are paying for credit cards, which I guarantee you, when you start looking at those, when we run pavilions and all that, you know, if you can put it on a credit card, that's what most people are going to do. They're going to have their deposited credit back to their account before their bill even comes. So I don't see the $100 as being something that's going to deter somebody from having a bonfire, um, especially if they know they're going to clean it up and get their money back. If they're not going to clean it up, well, shame on them. But I don't have a problem with it. Well, and just one more, um, you know, we have a huge amount of projects starting November 1st, but there's still money traveling to the fire. And Alex will be off, so we can use the people that we have toward us. So there may be some adjustments to fire. And we may see or we a decline. Or we may be able to have the bonfire. But we're going to do everything we can to try to accommodate them. We talked about even as it gets closer, saving a couple of bites if we can convince someone. But if it's, you know, all high power. On a typical Friday and Saturday night during the season, are they almost always all full? Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Yes. So we average out uh, over 950 points per month. Wow. That's if you average out seven days a week, so there's eight fires, not seven nights a week. And we average, we said we would like to know, I have to come down eight or less. Mm -hmm. And then that number actually is averaged out to be eight to seven. Um, huh. Anything less, you know, not so much. It's very successful. Yeah. Yeah, well, no, it's great. You know, it's like yeah. a little bit nice. Right? Before, it's a special thing. Yeah. 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 Thanks for calling. They call several people. It's your business. Okay. Public comment is still open. Is there additional public comment? Uh, Diane, you've already spoken. Yeah. I've always wondered about that. <laughs> 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 well, there you go. Hearing that, I'll close public comment. Let me bring it back to council. Um, the recommendation was made by Courtney to kind of monitor this and give us some data. Is that acceptable as part of this? Um, I'm all for the data, but I think, you know, based on the fact that we're going to be, you know, in a renourishment project, I could see where our numbers might decline. Yeah. So, I mean, well, you know, we'll, we'll look we'll, at the numbers. We'll make, that, we'll make that a note and, and be able to give you that good estimate because we're, we're actually holding some open for that reason. Um, so we can move people around and, you know, and so on. So, um, so we'll, we'll be able to account for that when we report back to you. Very good. Okay, Gwen. Yes. Councilman Gibson? Yes. Councilman Montero? Yes. Yes, motion passes unanimously. Let's move on to agenda item number 10, which is uh, agenda items for next regular council meeting. Courtney? Just let me know if you have any issues or okay. anything to add. As you guys know, if there's anything that comes up, please get with her and uh, let's get it on the agenda or discuss it with Courtney. All right, and the last agenda item is adoption of minutes. I'd like to make a motion to approve the workshop meeting, City Council workshop meeting minutes for October 2nd, 2019, and the regular meeting for October 2nd, 2019. Votes for City Council. <laughs> All right. Councilwoman Gibson, second by Councilwoman Rosicki to adopt the minutes of October 2nd workshop, October, October 2nd regular meeting. Gwen. Okay. Councilman Montanero? Yes. Councilwoman Rosicki? Yes. Councilwoman Gibson? Yes. Vice Mayor? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Anything else for us, Courtney? That's it. Okay. Thanks for being here tonight, everybody. This meeting is Thank now you. adjourned. Sure.